production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, we have two feature stories for you. Disappointed that there aren't many wild turkeys on your property this hunting season? We'll ask some advice on how you can provide the habitat that will help them thrive. We'll have two Southern Gardening segments, Blue Butterfly Plants. They really are blue and they really look like butterflies. We'll also show you how to have pockets of color in your winter landscape. Our last story today is about how Mississippi's forest industry joined with the Habitat for Humanity to build a greenhouse in Meridian. At this particular project, one of the greatest of those is, you know, the philanthropical spirit that goes along with the project itself but also it's very educational to the entire community to see that not only can you build a house uh, with SFI certified wood, but that's something that can happen right here in Mississippi with quality professionals all the way from the point of harvest where we are today, uh, all the way through the, the manufacturing as, as we see all the way up into the house. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to a special feature story edition of Farm Week. Leighton, Farm Week began celebrating its 35th anniversary last fall. Well now this year we have rebroadcast some stories from days gone by, and our first fits that today. It aired originally in 1996, 17 years ago. It's about providing turkey habitat on your property. It's presently turkey hunting season in Mississippi, but to have turkeys now, you need to provide habitat year-round. You can do that and still have excellent timber production. It's an early March morning in southwest Mississippi. If anyone can lay claim to the thrill of the hunt, it's turkey hunters. They're eye to eye with an animal that has keen eyesight and clear hearing. They try to talk turkey by imitating its language while covered in camouflage clothing from boots to hat. When you're out in the woods hunting turkeys, it's easy to forget why the turkeys are there, or in some cases, not there. The reason is habitat. The better your land suits the needs of turkeys, the better your chances of having them. Turkeys are creatures of forest land habitat, and uh, over half of, uh, half of the southeast is forested. Uh, much of that in private land, so producing turkeys on private forest land areas is critical. Like many animals, turkeys need a varied habitat to be successful. They can live in hardwood or pine forests. With the increase in the value of timber, many landowners are cutting trees and replanting them in pine plantations. In the future, turkeys will need help from man in order to maintain their present numbers in Mississippi. The key to having a good wild turkey population is production. We've got to have successful nests, and we've got to have good survival of the poles. And so habitat, proper habitat for nesting areas, um, brood rearing areas, feeding, courtship, the whole thing, uh, has to be provided. And we, we achieve that habitat with a good mix of forest land habitat and openings. Stewart says turkeys can do well on land that ranges from as little as 15% open space up to 65%. Logging roads such as this one with wide shoulders can become important areas for turkeys to raise their young. Turkeys will normally nest within 10 to 20 yards of an opening, a roadside or an edge like this. And uh, we've got pretty decent nesting habitat here in this pine forest, although uh, it probably does need a burn and that will help open it up some and produce more food. So the, the hen will bring them from the nest out into brood rearing habitat and uh, they can pick up grasses and the hen and the poles later on will use these roadsides to pick up uh, oh, a lot of seed heads that are going to be produced here with some of these grasses and, and different weeds like that. Some of the more favored foods would include hard mass like acorns in the fall and winter, uh, green stuff in the spring and summer, 
the seed heads late in the summer that you might find out in a, in a grassy field. Um, these are, are important foods. And surprisingly, to some people, uh, pine seed is a very good turkey food. So in, in years when we lose our acorn crop or don't have an acorn crop uh, to speak of, then uh, pine seed can be very important along with nearly any year, even when we do have an, an acorn crop, they'll use pine seed. Stewart says it's important to put gates on logging roads to keep out traffic and thereby encourage turkeys to use the areas. In pines, turkeys prefer older, thin stands, which have been control burned on a three to five year basis. The open understory provides food and cover. In pine plantations, Stewart says research shows turkeys do the best in trees two to four years old. The main goal is to control burn and provide open space. But if we can get into pine plantations fairly early with a, a burning and thinning program, uh, provide some openings, some permanent openings in with that pine plantation, we can produce good numbers of turkeys and, and achieve our objectives there for the wild turkey as well as white-tailed deer and other species. Providing openings for turkeys applies to hardwood forest settings as well as pine. This Claiborne County beef cattle operation is owned by the Covington family. It's 60% hardwood timber land and 40% pasture. Since turkeys nest on the ground, it's important to avoid mowing pastures or burning too early in the spring. If we can avoid practices such as bush hogging and disking or burning during the nesting season, say from mid-March through uh, June or July, uh, ideally we would cover most of the nesting season then. At the Covington farm, they wait until the latter part of June to mow, and even then, they leave some pastures unclipped. Well, about five years ago on the place, we went into just, we really want to make it look good, so we clipped down all our pastures, in which it looked pretty, but it was pretty detrimental to our turkey population. We noticed after the first couple of years that we were seeing fewer and fewer successful hatches, and uh, we contributed to it. There just wasn't enough brood area, so. That's what we did. We came back in and left some areas so that the hens would have places to, to raise their little ones. If we do need to bush hog or, or clip a field uh, during the nesting season, if we can leave a perimeter area around that field undisturbed, uh, then uh, that will also help us because most of those nests will be around the edge. Another way the Covingtons keep up turkey numbers is not to harvest every bird they see. No year old males known as jakes are taken and the killing of older gobblers is limited. We don't kill any jakes at all and on our, our big gobblers even in those cases even with 720 acres what I try to do is limit it to three gobblers and in special situations if we see we've got plenty of birds we will go ahead and kill four birds off here but four is the maximum we'll kill off this place in any one year. On this particular day, Covington called this jake in close before the turkey saw the farm wheat camera and decided he should go. Is the work to produce turkey habitat worth the trouble? For some, it is. I get more pleasure out of just going out and listening to the birds gobbling and calling to them and watching how they respond, how they react. From southwest Mississippi, I'm Artis Ford reporting. Go to our FarmWeek website if you'd like to see this story on turkey habitat. Website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll also have some links there to help get you started into providing habitat for wild turkeys while you're growing your trees for timber. <clears throat> and Lane, one thing about it, of course, you know I like to turkey hunt, and it is a lot of fun to watch them, to try to get them to come in, and of course you see other animals while you're out there, but you really can get good timber production and turkey production at the same time. You just got to get out there and provide them some areas to, to nest in and some areas to feed in and such as that. Uh, and maybe your neighbors won't shoot them all off your property. <laughs> <laughs> you hope anyway. <laughs> well, time now for our trivia quiz on Farm Week. This week, it's about Facebook fans of Farm Week. Now, Farm Week does, as you know, we hope, have a Facebook page and we invite you to visit it. In fact, you'll see many Farm Week items on there before the show is broadcast. Well, here to our question of the people who have liked Farm Week's Facebook page, are more of them women or are more of them men? We'll have the answer after today's Southern Gardening segments. Many gardeners know that sometimes a plant does not live up to its name. 
In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will show us the blue butterfly plant and that it really does live up to expectations. I really enjoy the spring season. Today I'm at Pine Hills Nursery looking for new plants for Mississippi gardeners. A variety that's sure to find a place in my landscape this year is blue butterfly plant. Known botanically as Clerodendrum eugodensa, blue butterfly plant has intricate flowers that actually resemble little blue butterflies in flight. The flowers are arranged in multiples on long arching branches. Individual flowers are about an inch in diameter with several pale blue lobes and a single darker blue violet lobe. I really like the way the stamens and pistil arch out and upward and remind you of eyelashes. Blue butterfly plants should be planted in full sun to partial shade in the landscape and needs consistent soil moisture during the hot summer months. This plant will have an open and airy growth habit and flowers on the current season's growth. This is a good attribute since blue butterfly plant can become gangly, potentially getting upwards of 10 feet tall and six feet wide. So pruning at any time to keep the plant neat and tidy will not impact flowering. This plant will flower from planting to the first frost in the fall. Though blue butterfly plant is considered tropical, it is tolerant of cooler conditions and is hardy down to about 20 degrees. For most gardens in Mississippi, this plant will return from the roots like many of our other perennial plants. For possibly the best performance, grow in a large container that can be protected during freezing weather. Blue butterfly plant is sure to attract a lot of interest, and since it propagates easily from stem cuttings, you can share with all of your gardening neighbors. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. But do you think having landscape color is difficult during the colder months? Well, in our second Southern Gardening segment today, horticulturist Gary Bachman will show us how planting pockets of color can brighten the winter landscape. During the winter months, it's difficult to have the entire landscape full of color. Today I'm at my friend Sandra and Joel's in Ocean Springs, where Sandra uses sunny spots to add pockets of color for winter interest. Approaching the front of the house, you can't help but notice the circular drive. Contrasting hardscape textures of distressed brick and earth-toned pea gravel frame the sunny front bed. Sandra has used a mixture of woody and herbaceous plants. Sonnet Snapdragon and Matrix Pansy are good choices along with ornamental kale. Raspberry Blast Supertunia adds a pink punch. The pink is repeated with the Mississippi medallion winner Shishi Gashira Camellia. Dwarf Abelia is a good green foundation. The new foliage emerges a muted pink. Antique planters by the front steps repeat the Sonnet Snapdragon and Matrix Pansy combination. At the side door, pink camellias greet visitors. In the backyard pool area, Sandra continues the idea of pocket color. She has colorful sweet potato vine and planters that will need protection when the temperatures are frosty. By the pool house, Sasanqua camellia adds splashes of color. So take advantage of sunny spots to create pockets of color in your winter landscape. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Time now for the answer to our trivia quiz today on Farm Week. Again, it's about whether more women or more men have clicked on the like button on the Farm Week Facebook page. Well, out of the 285 who have liked our Facebook page, more men is the answer. 56% are men, but the women aren't far behind at 44%. Now, interestingly enough, in Asia, we have six Farm Week fans in Pakistan and one in Japan. There's one Farm Week Facebook fan in Serbia in Southeast Europe, one in Madagascar off Southeast Africa, and one in Sweden in Northern Europe. We're going to pause now for a break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. How green is your home? Mississippi's Force Industry worked with Habitat for Humanity in Meridian to build a green certified home using the guidelines of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative.
prepared? I'd better be. After all, paying attention to details is what makes the difference. The more preparation and planning time I invest, the more successful and enjoyable the outcome. For everyone, I know everything can't be perfect. I don't expect it to be, but the time and effort I spent pays off when the unexpected happens. So yes, I prepared for my marriage until death do us part. Prepare for your marriage. Before we get back to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. The Union County Master Gardeners are hosting the New Albany Home and Garden Show Friday and Saturday, April 5th and 6th. Hours are 10 to 4 each day. It takes place at the Union County Fairgrounds at New Albany. Admission is free. Anything from landscapes to using high tunnels for commercial production will be covered. Raising backyard and pasture-raised chickens is on the agenda as well. Two beef cattle boot camps are occurring in April. They're sponsored by the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Mississippi Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station. You'll learn about hoof care, crossbreeding systems, forage, feed, and mineral nutrition. Register early and the fee is $35. At the door, $45. On Friday, April 12th, the boot camp takes place on the South Farm on campus at Mississippi State University in Starkville. Then, on the following Friday, it moves to the MSU Brown Loam Branch Experiment Station on Seven Springs Road at Raymond. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Our last story today comes from Meridian, Mississippi. A Habitat for Humanity house was completed there with the help of Mississippi's forest industry. In addition to the fact that a couple was able to experience the empowerment of house ownership, the house was built with wood which was grown and harvested according to the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. This voluntary standard is used by most Mississippi forest industry companies. This story first aired on Farm Week last April. I am so excited. So I can't hardly stand myself today, but I know God is in charge, and it'll be so much better now. I'm so happy now, but then when, when, it's, when it's completely done, I don't know how I'm gonna act now, because I'm just so excited now, just by being partially built. Joanne Davis and her husband, Willie Davis Jr., are anticipating the day when they will own their own home for the first time. The Davis House is the 70th to be constructed by the Lauderdale County Habitat for Humanity affiliate. These particular volunteers work for companies which have helped many people to build homes, Mississippi's forest industry. The Davis Home is sponsored by the State Implementation Committee for the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. The SIC is made up of representatives of Mississippi's forest industry. It's one of these things where it's not only an opportunity to give back to those communities where we operate, um, you know, and to give back and, and help those that are in need, you know, but it gives a chance to, you know, highlight the uh, sustainable forestry initiative that our company has, has been behind for many years. The State Implementation Committee is made up of public entities and private businesses which promote and guide the sustainable forestry initiative in Mississippi. SFI is a voluntary national program which promotes sustainable forestry growth with landowners, loggers, and forest industry. Its 14 core principles seek to keep forestry sustainable while protecting water quality, biodiversity, wildlife habitat, and at-risk species. The Mississippi State Implementation Committee funds training in the Sustainable Forestry Initiative for loggers, forestry consultants, and landowners. When the idea for funding a habitat house was brought to the SIC, the conversation turned quickly from whether to do it, but how to do it. Well, let's probably start from the bottom, from the beginning. Cutting the trees, following those, and really show the people what an impact the SIC and the SFI has in the community as far as jobs and follow the chain of command. I mean, the chain from one where it starts to where it ends. And that's exactly why we got involved. At this particular project, one of the greatest of those is, you know, the philanthropical spirit that goes along with the project itself. But also it's very educational to the entire community to see that not only can you build a house uh, with SFI certified wood, but that's something that can happen right here in Mississippi with quality professionals all the way from the point of harvest where we are today, uh, all the way through the, the manufacturing as, as we see all the way up into the house. 
The sustainable cycle of modern forestry has been illustrated in the wood products donated to the Habitat home. This particular load of logs was harvested off Plum Creek Timber Company land, which had been managed according to best management practices and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. The trees were harvested by a logging company, which had been trained as well in SFI and BMPs. It teaches the loggers how to do their BMP work, our best management practices, and as you said, your, your SMZs where you cross in streams and creeks, it teaches them how to do this with the least amount of impact. The harvested trees were then taken to Weyerhaeuser's lumber mill at Philadelphia, Mississippi, where they were sawn into lumber. We do a lot of wood products out of here, the dimension mill here in Philadelphia and uh, they end up in the houses where they're in the trusses or in the uh, framing of the house. So we're more than happy to, to be part of this and to, to do our part in this habitat to manage the house. The warehouser saw in lumber was then transported to Clearspan Components of Meridian, Mississippi. Clearspan is a manufacturer of custom engineered building components. It turned the lumber into wall panels, roof trusses and floor trusses for the habitat house. Clearspan cooperated in documenting the chain of custody needed to maintain SFI certification for the Habitat House. We're very appreciative of the Camel Group, but they invited us because of our involvement with the Habitat, local Habitat Group. And uh, basically, I, we can be a part of the tracking from the forest all the way down to the local house that's being put in. Norboard Mississippi's Guntown Mill provided SFI certified oriented strand board for the Meridian Habitat House. Norboard's Martin Faulkner says SFI has resulted in more trees being planted than are being cut in Mississippi. All the data shows that we actually have more timbered acres in the state of Mississippi now than we've had in over 100 years and we're actually growing more timber than we're harvesting now. Fonda Rush, director for Lauderdale County's Habitat for Humanity, says the timing was right when SFI's State Implementation Committee approached Habitat about building a home using SFI certified wood. And we were already sort of doing Energy Star homes and just not asking for certification. But on this, uh, we decided on our next house, we totally wanted to go to green and become a certified green home using the National Home Builder Standards for green building. So it all just began to work out really well because SFI is recognized by the National Home Builders Association standards. Habitat for Humanity is a nonprofit ecumenical Christian ministry founded on the conviction that every man, woman, and child should have a decent, safe, and affordable place to live. Rush says the biggest misconception about Habitat is that the homes are simply given to their new owners. Habitat home sponsors donate money and Habitat raises other funds, but the new homeowners pay for their homes, helping provide funds for future construction. So it's an interest-free mortgage, and we sell it for what it costs us basically to build the houses. So the families do have to have income and uh, coming in, such as a job or disability. Habitat homeowners are also required to work on their homes, putting in so-called sweat equity. Volunteers have come from many places as well. The SIC and Mississippi's forestry-related companies like the Campbell Group in Meridian have held work days being blessed as they help to bless the Davises. Landscape help is being provided by the Mississippi State University Extension Service Master Gardener Program in Lauderdale County. If they get the keys, I think about that a lot. I know right then the home is finished. I'll be a homeowner. I can set myself, set my goal to live and go ahead on in life and keep on going. And you can watch this story again on our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. You can also find Farm Week stories on YouTube and Facebook. We'll also have links and information on Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the Lauderdale County Habitat for Humanity office. We'll also have a link to the National Habitat site in case you want to get in touch with a Habitat affiliate near you and work with them. That's farmweek.msucares.com. Of course, Layton, I did air originally last April. Uh, the house has been finished and they have moved in, so good news there. 
the Lauderdale Master Gardeners, when they landscaped uh, the place, they had a bent towards wildlife, you know, or urban wildlife. So once again, carrying sustainable, forth, carrying mm. forth the green sustainable mm. theme there as well. One of the things to think about is that you know trees are sustainable. If we think about it, they are growing. We can cut them and we can plant them again. They are trapping greenhouse gases. So a lot of things that come in trees as far as um, being good for the environment, yet we also can get lumber from them and, you know, obviously build homes for people who really need them. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, the present outstanding Mississippi Tree Farmer of the Year. Artist John Arachea turned his land into a tree farm, which he then shared for many years with the school children and families of the Oxford area. In Southern Gardening, the Indica Azalea. It has big flowers and will also give you the yearly deadline for pruning them. Narrow bases Next week, we'll also have highlights of the recent Mississippi Peanut Growers Association meeting in Hattiesburg. There are no peanut futures contracts, so marketing strategies were a hot topic on the agenda. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week.